around because I don't trust the registrar. some version of this course for a little over 30 years. It started out as 37, three, actually started out as 337, and then they put a 1 at the end for some reason that I don't understand. And that's the graduate course in course 3. Um, and then there's a graduate course in course 2, um, and this, these are basically J courses. And then a couple of years ago, I asked for um, an undergraduate course number, and they gave me an experimental course number or something. I don't know what 3S, what's up, and what means, what the S means. Do you know what it means? Okay. They've gotten, they've gotten too complex on the numbering system for me to be able to figure out. Um, but in any case, it's basically the same course, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it says it has prerequisites if you're an undergraduate. Uh, I don't consider it has prerequisites, but the department or somebody said I should have prerequisites, okay? So uh, it's just easier on something like that to do what they say. But I've had uh, people, well, I've taught this course for people in industry, um, and I've had uh, people with high school degrees take the course, and you can get something out of it. I've had people with philosophy degrees from college, okay, or psychology degrees, and they've taken the course, and they've been able to get something out of it. Um, but uh, it's partly that I have a different philosophy about teaching. Uh, I was an MIT freshman, came here as a freshman in 1968, uh, finished my doctoral degree here, went off for about two years to industry, came back as a faculty member, I've been on the faculty for something like 38 years. Um, I decided about 10 years ago, well, actually, I decided longer ago than that, about 25 years ago. I didn't like the way we teach. Um, but it wasn't until about 10 or 15 years ago when I stepped down as department head, and I was I turned 50, and I said, I'm just going to enjoy myself for the rest of my career. I'm not going to play these silly political games around here. And I'm going to teach the way I want, um, and uh, I don't care what the rest of the institute says about that. So, in fact, um, the problem I have with the way we teach, and I realized this about 20, 25 years ago, I went down to have breakfast. Um, one of my children had left their math book on the uh, kitchen table. Uh, they were in high school at the time, and I, I looked through the math book, and they had two pages on every subject. Two pages on derivatives, two pages on the integrals, two pages on exponential. I had never known that mathematics came in two page lumps. Okay, uniformly, two pages on every topic. And there were 120 topics in that book. And so obviously they would do one topic a day, and all they were doing was preparing the students to take the SATs. They weren't trying to teach them math, they were trying to teach them to pass an exam. 
And to a certain extent, um, that's what I saw at MIT, except the problem at MIT is you already know how to take exams. You're an MIT student. You wouldn't have gotten here if you didn't know how to take exams. So there are no exams in this course, which upsets a few students, because they really would like to show how much smarter they are than their classmates because they can pass an exam. Well, um, for me to teach you uh, a course that um, will help you pass the exam means I have to cover a certain amount of material, particularly up to the day before the exam. But you will get really upset if I ask you a quiz question that's not on the exam. So I solve that problem. I don't give an exam. And that way I can lecture on whatever I want. And I actually would much prefer that you ask a question and have me see if I can spend a half an hour answering your question in more detail than you ever thought possible. Um, because I've already heard the lecture. I've been doing this for 30 years in this course. I've heard the lectures. I know what I'm going to say. And I'm sort of bored with it myself. It's not actually that boring for you, because most of you will have heard it for the first time. But I would much rather digress with the question than to necessarily plow through whatever I have as an outline in my notes. So uh, please ask questions. If you don't understand something, say it, OK? Um, I learned a number of years ago, actually, uh, back around 1990, I was on a committee. And this was actually part of LFM, which is the predecessor of LGO. And uh, John Little was a professor, institute professor at Sloan School. And he was chair of the committee. And he called it the, the Do Something Committee which I sort of liked, because I've been on plenty of do-nothing committees. Um, and we were supposed to look at distance education. Stanford already had a great, what they call, tutored video instruction. And what that meant is they would videotape a regular class at Stanford. Uh, they would send the videotapes, this 1980s technology, right? They would send the videotapes out to some, uh, some Intel site or Hewlett Packard site in Colorado or Arizona or somewhere, and they would have um, a group of five or ten students uh, watching the video at a convenient time in some conference room at the company site, and they would select one student who might, might actually have a PhD in the subject, or the topic area, um, who they called the tutor. Or they may just take a student who is taking the course at the same time and say, you're the tutor for this, and you have to get together, you have to know how to turn on the video recorder and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they actually found the students who took TBI courses did better than the students on campus. Okay? There have been a number of studies since then that taking things by delayed video instruction, actually the students get better comprehension than if they do it in the classroom. And you can say, well, why is that? Well, I didn't know why, but we determined out of that committee, John Little's committee, that um, General Motors had asked for Tom Eager to teach his welding course. At General Motors in 1990, you could get a master's degree by essentially doing something like the Stanford TBI. You could get it from RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic, or Purdue University. But MIT had never given credit at a distance in 1990. So we determined that we would take 20 students at GM Tech, Tech Center. I would videotape my lectures. MIT agreed, I had to go to the provost to get permission to take the tuition money, which was about $40,000 from those uh, 20 students at GM. And we would plow it into MIT's video production people. And I had to take everything over to building nine every morning at about 5.30 in the morning. And we would lecture at 7.30 in the morning. And we videotape it in front of the students, and I provide breakfast for the students on campus. They would send it to General Motors. And I told the General Motors students at the very beginning, I want you to, ask, since you're not in class, to ask me one question a week. You can fax me, you can email me, you can, you know, whatever, you can call me. But I want every student, all 20 of you, to ask me 20 questions a week. Well, about halfway through the semester, I had one question, okay, so obviously they weren't listening to me, but in any case, I had one question, and then General Motors said, we want you to go out and meet with the students, and so they paid for me to go out and meet with the students, I said, how come I don't get any questions? 
And they said, well, if we don't understand you, we just play the tape back. And second time around, it usually makes sense. So I realized, it's not that the faculty are incoherent. We just think they're incoherent because our attention span over 50 minutes lapses or whatever. You miss a little bit when you're getting it live. But when you get it by delayed video, you can stop, replay it, and follow on what's going on. That's why the Tudor video Stanford students were doing better. They could play back what the professor said. Now, sometimes the professors are incoherent, but nonetheless, well, you know, most of the time, it's actually not very incoherent, but when you hear it the second time, it makes more sense. So what happened is, <coughs> over the next couple of years, I was doing this for the General Motors students, and um, students would come up and say, oh, Professor, you're out from this class, I'm going to a conference, or you know, my great aunt uh, died, or I gotta go to the funeral. And I say, okay, just watch the movie. And so I actually decided, um, and we lost the GM funding as GM lost $23 billion one quarter or one year because they had to fund their pension fund. Um, but uh, um, I decided to videotape the lectures. I pay out of my pocket to videotape my lectures. And I have been for the last 25 years. Uh, because it means that you can watch the movie if you can't make the class. There are people who take this class who never come to class except to do the report for the presentation. Uh, so you don't have to even come to class. You're supposed to watch the video. I remember one student evaluated the course and said they watched it while they were fixing dinner. Okay? Um, and I thought that was a great evaluation. I mean, you know, why not? If it's interesting, I mean, I, you know, I <clears throat> turn on the nightly news, okay? Uh, tell, listen to Tommy hear tell stories, okay? So in any case, um, what you have to do in this course is a presentation. Okay. The presentation can be on anything you want. It's going to be a live presentation. If we have 30 or 40 students, which is what we've had the last few years, um, I used to try to say, well, we're talking about structural materials. You should be on structural materials. And then I found you know what you're interested in, and you will do a better job if you present it on something you're interested in. And actually, most of the students who are here are here because they're interested in something about science and technology. I've had people talk about fancy doorknobs. I've had people talk about gothic arches. I've had talk, people talk about uh, pole vault uh, poles, which are actually quite interesting composites, okay? Uh, where you structure the stiffness and the modules and stuff. Anyway, um, uh, any topic you want, but you've only got 10 minutes. That means no more than 10 Overheads. And I don't want you to say, how, how General Motors builds cars in 10 overheads. That's a little broad. Or how Boeing builds airplanes. I want you to pick, pick something a little more specific. I had a very interesting one a couple of years ago from a student from Mexico who talked about Adobe bricks. Okay? Uh, because that's how they build homes in Mexico, in many of the rural areas. They make them out of Adobe, which is just mud and straw. Remember, uh, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, you can't make bricks without straw. Well, you know, you take mud and straw, and it's a composite material. It's a structural material. I didn't know that instead of using regular mud, they often use manure because it keeps the flies away. Okay? I always thought manure attracted flies, but apparently adobe manure uh, helps keep the flies out of the house or something. Maybe it keeps the people out of the house. I don't know. Uh, but I've learned a lot, and I think if you look back at the student evaluations, I think students feel like they learn as much from the evaluations, or from the student presentations, as they do from the lectures. It sort of hurts a little bit, and it hurts my pride. But nonetheless, uh, you know what you're interested in, and you're very good at it. So uh, you get to make a presentation. Uh, until last year, I could say I'd only given two, two grades in 30 years. A's and F's. Um, now I actually gave last year some B's. Okay? And that's because, I'll tell you quite frankly, two students got up and gave me the Wall Street Journal approach to materials. Okay? It's garbage. Absolute garbage. I'm sort of famous over at Sloan when I was in the LFM program. 
was sitting there ready to lecture. They have these big lecture halls where you're at tears and they have their names in front of it and they can call you out by name. It's kind of the Harvard Business School approach of, of intimidating students. Um, and uh, a number of students were sitting there reading their Wall Street Journal. And I made some comment. Well, you know, if you're reading the Wall Street Journal, it's no longer news. Okay? They think they're reading the Wall Street Journal to find out what the latest and greatest technology is. And what would you find if you were reading the Wall Street Journal nowadays? You'd be reading articles and materials about what? What topic areas? Additive manufacturing, nanotechnology, biotech, right? Eh, very rarely would you hear something exciting about steel or even aluminum or copper. And actually what we're going to do in my part of the course is we're going to talk about steel. But I spell it with two E's and not an E and an A. Okay, so it's different. Um, I will tell you as we go along some secrets I learned as a student and as a young faculty member about how teaching is done. How many of you have ever been to a class where the professor spent the entire hour doing a derivation? know why? Because they didn't have time to prepare a lecture. I realized that my first year on the faculty, I'd been traveling, I was teaching a graduate course on information processing. I came in that morning, I hadn't really prepared the lecture. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do at 9 o'clock, and I looked and I said, oh, I can do this derivation. And all of a sudden, a light went off. I thought, oh, that's why the professors would go up there and spend a whole hour making mistakes on the board and confusing the students and the students, putting all the students to sleep. And I swore to myself 37 years ago, I would never do another derivation in class. And I had to. I did it that day because I didn't have anything else. I didn't have time for a fair lecture. But since then, when I was teaching thermo and stuff, it was, if the derivation was in the book, I would write it out. Okay? And I would copy it. And I would hand it out to the students and I would say, here. Here's how you derive this formula. <coughs> Let's talk about what it means. Who cares about doing the algebra of how to derive it? Okay? You know the professor's going to make a mistake. Okay? They always do. So anyway, so why should I embarrass myself by making that kind of mistake? I can tell you stories, and if the stories aren't accurate, you wouldn't know. Because it's my story. Right? So if I'm just talking fantasy, it's fantasy. So anyway, we're supposed to be talking about structural materials. There are two of us, Dr. Simone Belmar, who will be lecturing tomorrow. I'll be in today and Friday. Uh, Dr. Belmar will be here Wednesday and Thursday. And you have to do um, uh, three modules in this course. I lecture in modules. And these are 12 lecture modules, approximately. And I'll give you some other knowledge I to you right now. Um, if you look on Stellar, I used to hand everything out. That's the way we did it in the old days before we had things like Stellar. But uh, on <coughs> Stellar, you'll see sort of a syllabus in this course, Monday through Friday, 9 to 10, uh, through about mid-April, the front load of this course. Since there are no exams, since you don't have to read anything except what you want to read, because you don't have to study for an exam, um, I will give you plenty of reading on Stellar. If you want to read it, you can. In fact, one student's evaluation a number of years ago is you can get a lot out of this course or a little, depending on what you want to put into it. And that's fine. If you want to pay this kind of tuition and get nothing out of it, be my guest. Okay? Um, I, I pass. I don't need to pass. Okay? Uh, and you can probably pass this course without doing much. But hopefully it will make it interesting enough that you'll want to do something. So we'll be in here. Um, you're going to have to do three modules. There'll be two lectures live. My, I will do material selection this, this semester, 12 lectures. I'm just across the, the hall, basically. My assistant's Jerry Hill, and uh, she likes to help students. So um, and if you need to come see me, I tend to get in about 7 o'clock in the morning. I tend to go home about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't like traffic. Like I said, 16 years ago when I stepped out of the administration and said, I'm going to enjoy myself for the rest of my career. Um, 
And then Dr. Belmar is going to do what he calls an overview of structural material science. And um, we have a little kind of catalog description of what we're going to do. Third, third module, you don't have to do these modules. In fact, um, well, I might as well put it up. If, this is the list of students that the registrar says are taking the course. The ones in yellow are taking this course for the second time or the third time. No? Oh, okay. Well, my secondary highlighted it, so she got it wrong. But anyway, okay. So we make mistakes. That's why we don't please you. Um, so I flunked on that one. But in any case, whatever it is, you can see a significant number of students take the course. Trace, Trace is taking it. She's a junior. She's taking it for the third time, right? She videotaped it last year, and she I gave her a, a different job uh, this year. I actually paid people to do the videotaping and things. Um, I lost my lecture notes to codes and standards, which is where I was going to do this term. So she's going to go back, and she gets to, you hadn't taken codes and standards, right? Mm -hmm. So in any case, she gets to, to watch codes and standards at home on her computer screen. By the way, these are all essentially now on YouTube. So if you get uh, 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 continuous streaming, you don't have to download. That was one of the problems before. But in any case, you can see when Dr. Belmar taught, when I taught, what the subjects were. We've been doing this type of stuff since on YouTube since 2011. And I could go back to 1986, except I don't have all the video tapes anymore. Actually, I didn't start video until 1990. But in any case, uh, Welding is my own research area that I got tenure in. Manufacturing is kind of what I've been doing since. I've always been interested uh, essentially in uh, uh, structural materials. Um, and so Trace is going to watch codes and standards, outline it for me, tell me what I said, try to collect back my old stuff that I lost with my notes and things. So next fall I'll probably do codes and standards again. Um, but in any case, uh, you can take it. There are enough modules that as long as you take three different modules you can repeat the course and someone could take it a fourth time but why would I run out of stories after a while so, um, <coughs> but in any case um, so we're going to um, hopefully unless both of us are out of town one day we will have class every day of the uh, of the week and we'll finish up sometime in uh, before spring break. In fact, we might even start your presentations before spring break. Uh, I have to watch all of 30 some presentations, uh, but I make the students usually watch about 20. Okay, we can do about three presentations a day. If you can't come in on Wednesday, one person email me, they can't come on Wednesday, it's kind of conflict with another class. By the way, this is one of the reasons I can get more students. Because a lot of students can't take a class because of conflicts. In fact, I have students from course 15, course 2, course 3. And I often have new, do the, new, the nuclear engineer or air astro people show up. So, okay. But I typically may have students from five or six um, departments, and when, what time can you find that they could all meet? Uh, when I, I remember years ago, we tried to do this before uh, uh, the institute was quite as flexible. And the only time that everyone could meet was 4 o'clock Friday afternoon from there, okay? But I, by doing it um, this way, we don't have to worry about, by doing asynchronous lecturing, which means you can watch the video, we don't have to worry about that. Um, are there any questions, okay, about any of this stuff right now? So you're supposed to watch about 36 lectures. You're supposed to give a presentation. There's going to be different materials to read. This particular handout will be on Stellar. This says you should learn something about communications, and we will talk some about communications as far as that goes. Um, and even if you didn't, even if you couldn't come to class to do any of the live lectures, you could still find out what I said back in spring of, or uh, the fall of 2014. Um, I did this, this set of lectures, although I'll guarantee you it's not going to be exactly the same. And in 2013, in the fall, I did it. Dr. Belmar did some version of his things in the spring of, of uh, 
last couple of years. Um, so this is just the same type of stuff off my website that shows you what we lectured on when. Um, so I told you about the grades, told you about the requirements, any topic you want. Um, there are some handouts that will be on um, Stellar that you can read. Uh, one of them is, I actually now use this course to try to figure out some things that I've always tried to figure out. And last fall, I taught a course, I didn't even know what the course was going to be, but it was called What is Engineering? And because I've always wondered, what is the difference between science and engineering? They went to college and put some, some quotes up. But I always liked Theodore von Karman, uh, who said, a scientist discovers that which exists, an engineer creates that which never was. Theodore von Karman was one of the greatest scientists and engineers in the United States in the 20th century. He founded the Jet Propulsion Lab at Caltech. Um, and he explained why the Wright brothers were successful. From a scientific point of view. Uh, and Joel Moses used to be provost in the media lab, creates that which never will be. Okay, this is corollary to that. But I came up with three pages, or four pages, three pages, three pages, four pages, almost four pages, three and a half pages of quotes from different people. Uh, and this will be posted, you can read it. But at the end of the semester, I basically came up, science seeks to increase human knowledge, engineering seeks to improve the human condition. That's my definition of the difference between science and engineering. And, and I basically, we just explored what, engineering, what engineers do, what scientists do, what's the difference, and it turns out there are huge differences in the attitude of scientists and engineers. So if you want to hear about a philosophy of what is engineering, you would do a module on what is engineering, because it's on the web. Um, this, is, this is something I put together. I'm just trying to write a book on, um, which I call 50 Years at MIT right now. But that's what I focus. But anyway, in the book, I wrote the prologue, or the epilogue, uh, early on. And so I have surviving at MIT lessons learned, and this kind of is a summary of some of the things that I learned um, as a student at MIT. The number one, be humble but don't be humiliated. Humility comes from within. Humiliation is imposed upon you by others. And it's kind of talking about some of the stresses we find at MIT. Um, a lot of this stuff has nothing to do with structural material. Most of this has nothing to do with structural materials. But I wrote an article for the faculty newsletter about leadership management and education at MIT. I wrote that about 10 or 11 years ago. I wrote it so Bob Brown would not become president of MIT. He was provost at the time, he's now president of Boston University. When he left for Boston University, I sent him an email, said, bye. <laughs> um, but uh, I sent this to, well, actually, when I wrote this for the faculty newsletter, it's sort of about 30 some years of MIT and what I've observed, what makes MIT unique. And a lot of alumni, some of my old classmates have read it, and they say, wow, that's right on, okay? Um, and it talks about the strengths of MIT, the weaknesses of MIT. It talks about some of the teaching problems we have at MIT that I just talked about, so you can see that. Uh, I said we talked about communications, it turns out I will hand this out because I hand it out all the time to students. Um, and it turns out, you know, when I started as a young faculty member, my department head, Walter Owen, brought me in and said, no matter what anyone else tells you, it really is public or parish. Okay? And um, so I published papers and had graduate students and wrote research articles and all this other stuff. But, um, what happened is after the World Trade Center collapsed, about three weeks afterwards, Joel Park got a request from the editor of the Metallurgical Journal saying, will you write an article about the World Trade Center collapse? Everybody was writing articles about the World Trade Center collapse. And Joel says, well, why don't you ask Tom Eager? So he emails me and says, will you write an article for the Journal of Metals, okay, J-O-M. So this is published in December 2001. It took me 
about three or four weeks to gather some information and write this article. I spent three hours total writing this article and researching. Now, Chris Musso was my graduate student. He was an old film student, and he uh, he helped me with some of the research. So he's a co-author. But I wrote it. The reason I was willing to write it, I was sick of hearing all the misinformation and incorrect information that was in the press. Okay, newspapers. And I well, I can tell this story, but I used to read Time magazine in high school religiously every week. Okay. I got to MIT, it's the middle of the Vietnam War demonstrations. For the first time in my life, I was right in the presence of some of the news. And when I would read what it said in Time Magazine, what I, compared to what I saw being present, I realized there was no correlation whatsoever. Time Magazine is a complete fantasy, it's complete fiction. And I quit reading it, and every now and then, Someone will tell me, oh, there's an article in Time, I'll go and read it. And it's a complete fiction. Time Magazine, Newsweek, um, US News and World Report, they're all fiction. Okay? They have nothing to do with reality. I only know a couple of magazines that I think are reasonably accurate in terms of when I read the stories that are things about that I know about, that I can actually recognize the story. Okay? I just I can't. And as a result. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about a question I got from Technology Review last week. I will spend a lot of time talking to <coughs> reporters with the idea of I want them to try to get it correct. Okay? But anyway, so I agreed to write this article. I spent three hours writing it. And I sometimes say, what can you say when you know nothing at all about a subject? It turns out you can usually say quite a bit if you know the basic science and the basic physics. And this one also chemistry and heat flow and combustion, which I knew because I'm a welding engineer and because I've done fire investigations and things. The first thing I knew, and the reason I agreed to write it is, I know you don't melt steel in a fire. Everybody was, oh, the fire was so hot it melted the steel, and that's why the World Trade Center came down. I knew that wasn't true, so I had to research why. And I researched why, and some guys over in civil engineering were giving a seminar uh, about it. Chris Musso went and taped it for me. I got permission to tape it, and I watched their seminar. And they, and you can read the article if you want. But the thing is, I wrote it with the idea that I was writing this for a high school science school. And so I wasn't trying to be flowery and get com complex. I wrote it so someone with a little bit of education could understand it. And in fact, that's part of my philosophy about teaching. A lot of faculty try to make something so complex to prove how much smarter they are than you. Well, a good teacher makes things as simple as possible because they realize the students are probably smarter than them. And I certainly know that the MIT students are smarter than me. I entered MIT as a freshman in the bottom third of my class. Okay? I had terrible preparation in high school. And I'm not really all that smart in a lot of ways anyway. And I hate to do derivations. And I hate to do problem sets. And so I don't make the students do it. But for the first 10 or 11 years after the World Trade Center, if you Googled WTC collapse, this was the number one hit. More people were reading this article. Within a year, there were websites out against me by the conspiracy theorists. Okay, you know the conspiracy theorists, the 9 11 truthers? Okay, and they hate me because people can understand this. Okay, and they're sure that there was a conspiracy. And there's no conspiracy here. I can explain every physical phenomena they talk about much more simply than they can um, if you just go back to the basic science. And so, the philosophy here, actually, for this course is I'd like you to, I'd like to point out things to you that you already knew, okay? Um, I might as well tell that story. My apologies to uh, all of some others who have heard some of these stories. But when I was, uh, in 1988, um, Lester, Lester Thoreau became dean of the Sloan School of Management. He wanted to build bridges to the School of Engineering, and so he decided that we had at the time 
a program for senior executives at the Sloan School. And this was a nine week intensive program. You basically would live down at MIT Endicott House. You paid $50,000 tuition for nine weeks. And the uh, Sloan School faculty would come in and teach you eight hours a day, six days a week. Uh, you'd do some homework, it wasn't, but you wouldn't get graded. Because most of, I was the, was the only academic out of 50. There was one, I was, so I was 38 years old. There was a guy from the Xerox who was 33. We were the two youngest in the class. Most people were 40 to 60, 45 to 60, and many of them were CEOs of companies. And there was a couple guys from General Motors, and they were just managers of businesses. But a General Motors, a manager of a business, is typically a billion dollar business, okay? One of them was in charge of all the lighting for all the cars. That's a several billion dollar business. So not everybody had fancy titles, but they were all managing billion dollar companies. And um, so during that, and Harvard still has one of these things. They call it advanced management program. It's generalized, it's 13 weeks. And uh, essentially a company will send someone back who's never had real business school training, and give them some business school training in an intensive environment. And then, then they have the imprimatur of the business school. Okay. And so Lester Thoreau was dean of Sloan School, had been made dean of the Sloan School. And about a week before Christmas, they sent around a note saying, uh, any engineering faculty member who would like to take this nine-week intensive program starting in February, uh, they're going to give out one scholarship and they'll waive the tuition, um, the $50,000 tuition. <coughs> and so I thought, well, you know, I've taken some business courses when I first worked in the industry and I decided, okay, I'll do it. So I applied. I suspect I was the only person out of 350 faculty in the School of Engineering who applied. So I got it. Sort of like my mother came in third in a French contest in high school. It snowed that day. She was, only three people showed up. She came in third. So I, I got selected because I was probably the only person who was willing to completely clear my schedule for five weeks later. Uh, and so I went through the Sloan Senior Executives Program. Uh, so I'm now a Sloan alum, um, at least in terms of giving money. Um, and um, Lester came in. Lester at the time, had, he, was, he had written books. He wrote The Zero Sum Game. He wrote The Zero Sum Game? I think he did. Anyway, he was on Meet the Press and things, you know, Face the Nation and things like that on TV. He called himself an economics educator. Uh, his colleagues at, at uh, Sloan and the economics department called him less than Thoreau. Okay? Um, because he was a little simple about things. But Lester came in and he would get, at that time, this was 1988, he would get $30,000 a lecture, which is sort of like Hillary getting $150,000 a lecture now, which is part of some board of directors of some big company or something. Uh, $30,000 in 1988 was, was almost real money um, for a couple of hours of work. Um, but Lester was just a very engaging speaker, and we were all enamored with him. And we all just thought this talk was wonderful, uh, and we got it for free. Okay, well, not exactly. I got it for free. Other people had to pay fifty thousand dollars tuition. Uh, but um, so the second time he came in, uh, you know, he came in twice in the nine weeks. I was sitting there analyzing what was it that he did. What was it about his communication style that made him such an engaging speaker? And stuff, and everyone else was just—they were still in Africa, and they were just, you know, reveling in this, these words, pearls of wisdom from the lesser. And uh, uh, so, I'm sitting there trying to analyze it. When he finished, I realized he didn't say anything I didn't already know, but it was the way he said it. Okay. And so it was a great—that was a great turning point in my career. I used to go to conferences, and I'd get up and I'd talk about the technical details of what I've been doing research on, and throw up a couple of differential equations or whatever, impress everybody with the knowledge we had here at MIT. And after that, I decided, no, just think of the right way to say it. So it turns out in 1989, I had to give a keynote talk on resistance spot welding at a welding conference in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, or somewhere in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
and I got up to give this keynote lecture, and I said, they put 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile because you need 2,000 good ones. Okay. And that's something that people will remember. In fact, a year later, I was at a welding conference at a cocktail party, and right behind me, I heard someone say, you know, they put 3,000 spot welds in the average automobile because you need 2,000 good ones. It's not what you say, it's how you say it many times. I still love Lester's thing. I saw, heard him a couple years later. He was over at the uh, Cambridge Marriott giving a talk to a bunch of people in industry, and he's sort of lamenting that we, we lose some of our top faculty uh, at the Sloan School to go off the road to this other business school up the river. Um, and, uh, and we all knew he was sort of talking about Robert Merton. Anybody know who Robert Merton is? Robert Merton worked with Black and Scholes on derivatives. Those guys worked out the math for derivatives trading and predicting the value of something in the future uh, fairly accurately by what, the, uh, what you know today. And uh, anyway, Robert Merton left MIT. He'd been a graduate student under Black and Scholes. Black and Scholes passed away. But Robert, Moulton, uh, Robert Merton went up to Harvard Business School and he won the Nobel Prize for what he did with Black and Scholes. They were dead, he won it. Um, and, but Lester, he never mentioned Merton's name, but he said, fortunately, they tend to hire our extinct volcanoes. Okay? You don't have to explain what he's talking about there, right? It was a metaphor that speaks for itself, right? So I learned that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, and keep it simple, stupid. Um, and that's basically what this article is about. Uh, if you're interested, you can read it. And it turns out I will stand by this article what, 15 years later as being correct, okay? Because I just talked about the, the fundamental physics, okay, that we should all know. Um, so we're going to talk about Tower 7 collapse. Huh? Pardon me? Can you explain Tower 7's collapse? Uh, I think I can, although the truthers think I'm all wrong. Uh, but if you read this thing, you'll find that the reason you, the reason the, the first two towers went down, it wasn't because they had a fire. We'd had fires in skyscrapers before. But it was the first time we had had a fire with 20,000 gallons of fuel all on one floor. In fact, there's a nice picture. It's not in the article because I didn't see it until later. Just showing one floor just completely red. Okay? All around. Each floor is about an acre in size. Ordinarily, in a fire in a building, It'll start over in the corner over here or somewhere, and by the time it gets to the far corner, this was one acre, each, each floor is one acre. Everything over here has burned out the fuel and started to cool down and gotten its strength back, whereas the stuff is hot, it's still burnt. But in this case, we just heated up everything all at once. And so all the steel lost 70% of its strength. That wasn't enough to explain everything. You have to also explain the bundle of beams. That's in the article of how I could get the factor of five reduction in strength that I needed, okay? This is actually quantitative. That's why the truth is hated. Everybody hates things. I'm talking about the tower that wasn't Okay, I know. So, okay. okay. But the, the point was, on the first two towers, we know it was just fuel everywhere, right? Guess what was in Building 7? It was the emergency control station for the city of New York. It had a 20,000 gallon tank of diesel fuel to run emergency. It had diesel fuel piped all through the building. So as it caught on fire, and all of a sudden they started violating these uh, fuel lines, the building had a huge fire, a huge external fire load, okay, oh, 20,000 gallons of fuel inside the building. So don't put, 20, don't, don't put swimming pools full of diesel fuel in your buildings, because if they catch on fire, they want to collapse. So basically it fell down for the exact same reason of a huge fire all at once, as opposed to a smaller fire in the rest of it. Okay? So, okay, you, you're gonna have to get used to my kind of giving a preface to get to the punchline, okay? Because I can say, oh, it's because Building 7 had a, a stuff, but I, I had to explain that, well, the truthers are right. We haven't had other, we've had fires in other skyscrapers, but they didn't all come down. But we never had someone fly 20,000 gallons of jet fuel into the buildings either, okay, all at once, and just put the whole floor on fire. So Building 7 was basically the same reason. 
but it wasn't a jet. It was another source of 20,000 gallons of fuel. Okay? So all three of them had 20,000 gallons of fuel. And no one had ever designed for an extra 20,000 gallons of fuel feeding the fire. So, in my opinion, that's the reason Building 7 went down. Now, it turns out that the guy, the government, U.S. government spent several hundred million dollars investigating this, and the guy who was in charge of the investigation was a guy, Professor Sam Schunder, who had been a faculty member in civil engineering, didn't get tenure, and went down to NIST, and he was head of their fire investigation team for the NIST study of why the World Trade Center collapsed. And they have a report that's about this thing, okay? If you read it, you find kind of the same, you know, mine's, no. hey, what can I say in four pages? They said 400, right? You know, they, they get into more detail. There's no question about it. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so we're going to start talking about structural materials. And there's a couple things I want to say. But first of all, I've been using this, this uh, cartoon for a number of years at the Graduate School of Business. Now, I, I want you all to, I know you all want to make money, but today we're going to discuss making things, actual things. And two students in the back, or three students in the back. What? Things? I don't want to make things. And the other one says, I want to make money. The third one says, listen, let's sue the business school. We can make some money that way. <laughs> um, so that's part of the philosophy of things nowadays. You can't get your walk the way you do things the way you want. Uh, do it another way. So materials. There are various types of materials. This is, of course, on structural materials as opposed to functional materials. And the Japanese sort of coined this word functional materials. Structural materials, you have to remember, are used in very large volumes. And they're used, by definition, as being structural materials for their mechanical properties, which are tensile, compressive, shear, free, blah, 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 okay? And we're gonna talk about things over here on your left. Functional materials, on the other hand, are often very small volumes, um, and they're used for a multitude of properties, which can be chemical, magnetic, electrical, optical, thermal, or you can start adding two properties together, like piezoelectric. What's piezoelectric? That's mechanical force, and it gives electricity, or vice versa. Electricity will actually give you a mechanical displacement. That's how the Navy does sonar. They put electrical waves into a piezoelectric material, and they can get a displacement out to move the, the waves in the water. Magnetothermic, people are trying to figure out ways to make more efficient refrigerators. Thermoelectric, electrochemical, and you, the list could go on forever, okay? So when you're talking functional materials, you could be talking about materials that are worth millions of dollars a pound, okay? And you may, but you might not be using a lot of pounds. You might be using micrograms for some of these things. It might be a catalyst, okay? Um, but when we're talking mechanical properties of structural materials, we're tar talking large volumes. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to be talking about how do you make big things. Things like huge shifts, okay? That's an old shift. That's what I had. Um, nuclear reactors. Okay, or you could be talking about an all-composite aircraft. This is the first large all-composite aircraft. It's the B-22 Osprey, the Marine helicopter, about 60 million a pop. It's all uh, graphite carbon fiber composite. Could not fly without that material. Try to make it out of something heavy like aluminum, it'd be too heavy to fly. So they have to use a very expensive material and you can get to other materials that are even more expensive. This was the X-33 space plane, somewhere here. This is a piece of the X-33 hydrogen tank in the X-33 space plane. That, as fabricated, was $12,000 a pound. Now it's not very heavy, but that's the price of that, okay? And one of the things we're gonna learn is price is actually very important when we're talking about structural materials, because we use them in large volumes, um, and we want to know uh, how much it's going to cost to build something. If you're talking about a spacecraft, we're going to learn that the value of a pound saved in a spacecraft is $20,000 a pound for material in Earth orbit. People want to talk about colonizing the moon, well, okay? 
At $20,000 a pound, I don't think we're going to be sending a lot of people up in space. Okay? The millionaires can go. In fact, if you pay $7 million to the Soviets, they'll give you a ride up into space. Okay? Or is it 20 million? I can't remember. But it's sort of expensive to get payload into space. What's the value of a pound saved in an automobile over the life of the vehicle? $2. What's the value of a pound saved in a commercial aircraft like a Boeing uh, 737? $200 a pound. What's the value of a pound saved in a ship or a railroad? 20 cents a pound. It goes up by two orders of magnitude <coughs> from railroads to cars to aircraft, commercial aircraft to spacecraft. The space shuttle was supposed to get the price of going into orbit down from, in the 1970s, it was $10,000 a pound. They were supposed to drop the price to $1,000 a pound. The space shuttle, if you look over the life, 30 year life of the space shuttle, it came in at about $30,000 a pound. It was more expensive because they had a couple of failures, okay? Um, they got very expensive. Um, but in any case, so the price of a material is very important but it's not the dominant factor in selection of the material. Anybody have an idea? So when you say um, one pound saved in an automobile is worth two dollars, right. what do you mean by that specifically? If I have a Ford Taurus at 3,300 pounds, something like that, and I look at the mileage that you can get on the Ford Taurus, and I say it's going to have a 100,000 mile life before it's ready to be scrapped, Okay. And you say, okay, if I could drop the weight, they have curves that will show you weight versus mileage, right? And you can take the slope of that, and you can say, okay, if I took 100 pounds out, how much gasoline would I save over 100,000 miles? You save about $200 worth of gasoline for 100 pound savings, that's $2 a pound savings. Now, the calculation is a little different for a spacecraft or for an aircraft. Commercial aircraft, Typical life is 100,000 hours, okay? Which is more miles, but they're going a little faster, right? But still, the number is 100,000, but it's hours rather than miles. And it turns out, if you look at how much fuel it burns per hour and versus the weight, you can plot a bunch of commercial aircraft weight versus pounds of fuel, and you get the same type of curve, right, as you get for cars. But now you're talking hours of operation. And typically, because of fatigue cracks and other things, after 100,000 hours, you know, just send it to Arizona, park it in the desert, where it won't show up, and you can get spare parts out of there if you need them. But that's what they do with aircraft when they get to old age. And old age is 100,000 hours. That's $200 a pound. Okay? Uh, it used to be that uh, they put magazines on airplanes for you know, passengers to read. Vice presidents decided how many magazines and which magazines. Because the magazines cost $200 a pound if you carry them out. Okay? Over the life of the vehicle. And so coffee pots in the galley and things like that, they're very cost conscious about those things. And it's worth $200 a pound. And that's a very different business than an automobile at $2 a pound. And it's very different than a railroad at 20 cents a pound. And in fact, I'll give you an article that I wrote um, on Friday. I'll post it about this. What's the value of a pound of weight? And to get a pound of payload into orbit, that's not ours, okay? But for a spacecraft, go look it up. It's about $20,000 a pound of payload into orbit. If you, take, if you want to send up a telecommunication cell on satellite, and you weigh the satellite, and then you figure how many, it costs you $100 million to send it up there, you're gonna find it's about $20,000 a pound to pay a little more. So there are different criteria, but when you're talking about what is the value of a pound saved, if that's the question, it goes up two orders of magnitude between those, those four industries, okay? Something that not a lot of people, they, they certainly don't talk about it in the Wall Street Journal. They're all equal. Doesn't matter whether you're talking a spacecraft or a railroad. Pound saved, pound's a pound, right? Remember, who was it that said potato chips, computer chips, they're all the same? 
some, some guy who for president. Maybe it was a president. I don't remember. But anyway, some, some president 20 years ago said computer chips, potato chips, what does it matter which, what we manufacture? Well, to him, they're all the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's enough for today. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around every day the Thursday this week. I'll be back Friday to lecture. Dr. Belmar will be here tomorrow to start with